I will do a brief intro uh, as uh, I have known Ilana longer, even though both Julianne and I have interacted with her. So basically, I first met Ilana when she joined the OHBM blog team. Uh, and uh, we've been working together for about uh, maybe two years now. And uh, she has been really the lifeblood of the OHBM blog for a long time. Uh, she was recently uh, selected to be the blog captain. And then in a year, she will take over as the chair of the OHBM communications committee. Uh, so her science communication activities are really without uh, parallel. And uh, many of you will probably have seen her name or worked with her. She's also behind a lot of these OHBM on-demand tutorials that uh, incorporate the OHBM videos and try to write a coherent story behind them. Uh, looks like these will eventually be turned into official publications for Aperture, which is the OHBM uh, publishing platform. So that's one aspect of Ilana's work that I'm really impressed by. And the second is her interest in microstructural imaging. So uh, Ilana has been uh, working on MRI for uh, most of uh, the past 10 years or so. Uh, she has done a bachelor uh, in molecular biology in Graz, in Austria. And then uh, she did a PhD at Cardiff University, uh, uh, studying the role of GABA in fear and its relationship to emotion processing. Uh, and then eventually she ended up uh, doing a postdoc at the Max Planck. And uh, that's where she is currently uh, conducting her research. And her interests have been slowly shifting towards quantitative MRI, microstructural imaging, and in particular, pipelines and software for analyzing quantitative MRI data. And that's the reason that Julianne and I have met with her a couple of times to discuss about uh, opportunities for collaboration. And today is uh, our lab's chance to hear about Ilona's work, maybe get some ideas off the ground about uh, potential projects and collaborations, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. So uh, Ilona, fill me in if I missed something, and uh, welcome to the lab meeting. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. And yes, make this full screen. Can you see? Uh, my screen? Yes. Almost. Yes. Yep. Okay, now, good. So, right. So, this is actually a bit of informal, slightly awkward talk for me because it's a bit self centered. Um, but the idea was just to introduce myself and tell you a bit about where I'm coming from and my interests and what I've done so far. And then the second half, I would like to start doing a bit of brainstorming because I'm keen to apply for a fellowship to actually spend some time in your lab. And that's kind of the whole background of the talk as well. So I'm gonna go into a bit of detail about my, my background and research. Um, so as Nicola already said, uh, I'll start with a bit of a geographical background um, of Europe. So I was born in Graz in Austria, which is where I did my undergrad. Um, the main undergrad was actually psychology as well. And I actually spent two semesters in Toronto, so Canada is still a little bit homey for me as well. And then I moved on to Cardiff um, to do a PhD and I ended up doing a postdoc there as well. Uh, so I stayed seven years in general, which is here. And two years ago, I moved to Leipzig, Germany to be in the Department of Neurophysics, which used to be Bob Turner's lab, and now it's uh, led by Nick Weisskopf. And preparing this talk, I actually realized that I've experienced brain imaging from various perspectives. So I tried to frame the talk a little bit around that. So I started off about 10 years ago during my master's coming from a completely psychological perspective. And my project was on trying to look at the neural efficiency hypothesis of intelligence, which basically just suggests that intelligent people need few resources to do cognitive tasks. And at that time, I didn't know anything about brain imaging, so to meet kind of made sense as long as we did agree on the definition of intelligence. Um, and we found that intelligent people deactivate the default mode network a bit less when they do tasks. And retrospectively, 10 years later, I think it's still quite interesting, but there's so many challenges and limitations related to this kind of research. Just to mention one, there's inherently a problem that more intelligent people do things slightly different in the task. For example, they have shorter reaction time and there's basically no way to control for that. Um, and then also I got some slightly controversial statistical advice, for example, to lower the threshold quite a bit to get more power and to try different things to look at the same problem. Um, but apart from that, 
I'm still very grateful now for the experience and it started off my career. But back then I was already a, a bit um, unhappy about kind of the biological, how biologically superficial the project seemed to me. So we're looking at brain activation in relation to intelligence, um, sometimes more sophisticatedly called neural substrate. And I always wondered, what does it even mean? It means we're looking, we try to measure something in the brain and localize something, but not we're not really sure what it actually is. So then I moved to Cardiff with this kind of dissatisfaction in mind, and I did a PhD on um, yeah, bold imaging, combining it with GABA spectroscopy. And I was lucky enough that in Cardiff, there's actually quite a focus on looking at physiological background of functional imaging. And I was supervised by um, a physicist called Richard Weiss and a clinical psychologist called Xavier Caceres. And I was always kind of in the middle. So I was trying to understand emotion in the brain, but also how to best measure it and how to interpret it. And this sketch I kind of used throughout my thesis to try to visualize and make it a bit simpler, this complex interaction that I was trying to investigate. And you might not be surprised that actually my PhD didn't really shine a clear picture on the whole, whole project problem. Um, and also quite early on during my PhD, I was already confronted with this whole reliability and validity problem in your imaging. Um, so actually my project was meant to be a twin study looking at heritability of emotional responses. And I started off doing a repeatability study on these measures, and the results were slightly a bit disappointing. And then we did a road trip to see Tom Nichols in Warwick at that point, and his lab did some power analysis for us, and they said, oh, well, you actually need thousand twin pairs to do something meaningful. So in the end, we kind of dropped this. Um, and earlier, maybe I might have made the impression that I think a psychology background is not the best background for neuroimaging. And sometimes I still feel that maybe biomedical engineering would have helped me with certain things. But there are some things I'm really grateful for. And one of these things is kind of the methodological research, experimental design statistics background you get in psychology. Um, because in psychology, there's a lot of talk about reliability and validity because we're kind of trying to measure psychological constructs that we can't directly access. And I think in, in brain imaging, it's quite similar in the way that we're trying to access something about the biology that we can't directly measure, it's impossible to directly measure. Um, and I'm quite excited about these methodological problems and how to solve them. But then sometimes it's easy to forget that what we do, we actually do to provide something to the clinics. And um, I was lucky enough during my first postdoc in Cardiff to get some insight into the clinician's view on brain imaging, which is slightly different. Um, so I did a long clinical project on multiple sclerosis patients that kept me very busy because I was basically doing everything from planning, recruiting, clinical testing, scanning, pre-processing, analysis, writing, everything. So that was kind of four years of my life gone. And the aim of this project was to um, predict individual outcomes of an intervention in patients based on a wide range of metrics. Um, because we had so many predictors, we used the method called lasso regression, which is kind of a linear modeling approach that penalizes for the number of parameters retained in the model. And surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, none of the brain imaging measures we had, and we had a lot, actually retained in the model in the best model that fit. There was just clinical measures and behavioral measures. Um, and the model fit fairly well, actually, but it, it didn't include any of the brain imaging measures. And that kind of made me aware even more that there's a bit of a gap between what the clinicians actually want from us and what we can provide them with. The clinicians kind of want numbers that they can compare to some sort of threshold or range. And they also want these numbers to be reliable and valid, of course, even though they often don't use these terms because they're just too busy to think very deeply about research methodology. They have to do a lot of clinical work and teaching, most of them anyway. Um, but they're the ones who have to actually guide our research questions in a way. So I feel like there needs to be more communication and interaction um, for methods people to kind of bring the state-of-the-art methods to the clinic, but also the other way around, the clinic to provide us with guidance for how to do methods work that is a bit more meaningful sometimes. Right, so in this postdoc, um, because I was working with MS, that's when I started to get 
a bit more interested in microstructure and I started working with Derek Jones quite a bit. Um, and initially I was a bit irritated by the literature because I felt like reading clinical papers, they often interpret anything we measure with MRI as myelin. And then on the other hand, often the methods papers, they kind of treat MS pathology as demyelination. And of course, both aspects, the MRI physics and the pathology are super complex. Um, so um, I collected quite a good data set and I started looking into a few microstructural metrics to see what they have in common and where they might differ. Um, and they, I found that them to correlate in a meaningful way. But also I thought, okay, if they all measure similar things, maybe a combination, a data-driven combination with a PCA might provide more sensitivity to pathology. And that wasn't actually the case. Um, so from this study, we kind of concluded that um, some of the, these microstructural metrics might actually provide complementary biological information, and that could be useful for clinical trials, for example, to interpret the outcomes in the long term. Another um, project I did with Derek, Derek was on tractometry. So in the MS world, there seems to be kind of a good use for tract-specific, white matter tract-specific microstructural damage scores. Um, but tractography is already quite challenging, a bit of black magic in healthy tissue. In MS, it's additionally problematic because of the lesions. So people tended to just stay away from it and use atlas-based approaches instead. And um, we tried to see whether we can actually still meaningfully reconstruct tracts despite the lesions. And we found that it was possible and the results you get anatomically don't have a very strong overlap with what you would get from an atlas. But this might not necessarily be a problem if all you're interested is in like one average score for a white matter tract. Those corresponded fairly well. And sometimes I'm wondering how meaningful that is actually to just average across a huge white matter tract. But again, it's, it's fairly often used just because it's one individual number again that, that clinicians quite like. Um, so yeah, so doing this work, um, I kind of felt the urge to move a bit more towards validation um, of the metrics. So that's when I moved to Leipzig. Um, and now I'm doing a lot more postpartum scanning, right? Because that's the only way to get down to the ground truth histology of the microstructure. Um, and that's how validation is usually done. So you get um, exceed the MRI and histology, and then you do some sort of correlation between them. And I actually recently started working on a systematic review paper with um, Alberto Lasari from Oxford, who I think you know from the BITS proposals, maybe. Uh, they got inspired by this paper on iron, where they collected all sorts of papers that did validation of metrics and systematically like compared the approaches used. And we're doing the same for myelin now. Um, we can already see there's not very much consensus in terms of the MRI side, but also the histology side, and then the stat side. Um, and the stat side is often a bit dodgy. Um, and I find it a bit problematic because these are the papers we then cite to justify using these metrics to do brain behavior correlation and looking at individual differences. But also, I want to mention the validation itself, as you know, is very, very challenging. There's no simple way of actually doing what we would like to do. Um, and one of the challenges with myelin validation, for example, is myelin is so complex. It has so many lipids and proteins. It's not a uniform structure. And one of the projects I've been involved with in Leipzig um, is looking at spatially resolved mass spectrometry for large molecules. So in this case, lipids um, to investigate the lipid contribution to um, MRI. So there's quite a bit known Aviv Meza's group is driving this research a lot, looking at what different lipid types affect quantitative metrics in different ways. Um, and we're doing this spatially resolved. So what you can see here is um, that in different tissue types, so that's the cortex, that's the optic radiation, for example, different lipids are differently expressed in a way. So different tissue types have different lipid composition. And we want to find out whether that's actually relevant for um, the quantitative MRI metrics and their validation. So I recently got a grant awarded uh, for one year to look into this a bit deeper. So we're gonna have a student who's actually gonna dig into the 
data analysis side, especially of the MALDI as well, because that's not straightforward. And then looking at quantification of MALDI as well, which is also not very straightforward. So I'm hoping to move this a bit forward. Um, if you're interested, there's also my colleague Evgenia is going to give a short talk at the SMRM in August about this. So this has been a bit of a side project for me, really. Um, currently, the main project I'm employed to do is what we call the chimpanzee project. Um, I was interested in this because it also combines the postmortem imaging with uh, histological validation. And it's actually a, a project on comparative anatomy. So um, we get postmodern brains from chimpanzees who died in the wild or in zoos, and then we do fancy imaging on it. Um, and my part of the project is to develop the pipeline for the cortical microstructure with quantitative MRI, um, and also to look at develop, uh, longitudinal developments so or lifespan development in chimps. Um, if you're interested in this more application side, I'm just going to refer you to the OHBM talk I gave recently, and it's still online if you have access to that. But my day-to-day -day work looks a little bit different sometimes. Um, so I, that's why the next one is brain imaging from an engineering perspective. So I've really noticed that I'm in a neurophysics department now, and I really got interested into in how physicists and engineers approach brain imaging, um, not only in terms of where artifacts come from and so on, but also in yeah, how they do science. Um, and I just want to mention two challenges I'm currently facing because they're also a bit relevant for you, I think. Um, one is that when we do the whole brain scanning, there's often small air bubbles trapped, for example, in the ventricles where you can't get them out really easily. And they're hardly visible if you look at the short echo times um, here, for example, but um, they cause be zero inhomogeneities that are quite widespread, I would say. And then if you try to quantify R2 star, for example, it's exaggerated, so you have these strong signal uh, or R2 star increases in quite large areas. So I've started looking at Julian's code for how to potentially deal with this, but it needs a bit of, or a lot of tweaking, I think, to work for this high resolution isotropic Scan. So yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to work with this code hopefully soon. And also what I'm starting to look into is um, how to correct for B1 plus inhomogeneities for calculation of MT saturation, um, which we also look at. And the way we estimate MT sat is actually already kind of takes care of B1 plus, but not perfectly. Um, in my latest scanning session, I actually did a small experiment where I varied the pulse strength of the NT pulse and looked at the resulting NT set and it's not linear, there's small deviations. And in some areas where there's a lot of, lot of B1 plus dropout, basically, that has quite an effect. So hopefully again over the next few months, I'll, I'll work on this, maybe with Gunther Helms um, to find some way of calibrate this. Right, then also briefly want to, to bring up the coding side of things. So. Um, yeah, for all my code projects, I've written a lot of code, not only for MRI data, but also behavior and, and so on. And I always felt like my code is very project specific and not very useful for other people. But recently, I became a bit more aware that it's probably not very useful because it's not structured really well. And um, Agar's talk at the hackathon actually inspired me to think about this a bit more. And I ran my main pipeline through the Remy Gao complexity tool where you get numbers out and everything above 10 is a bit complex. Um, my code has a value over 100. So that's a little bit embarrassing, but also I think, yeah, it's just a sign that I want to spend a bit more time on these things just because I feel like we spend so much time coding that it would be really useful to share that with other people to make everything a bit more efficient. Uh, yeah, the last thing I want to mention is what Nicola also touched upon. So I really kind of like thinking and reflect a bit about academic life as well. So things like working environment and uh, organization of data and communication and so on. So I've been quite a bit involved in our department as well with organizing retreats and, and meetings about data and so on. And then I've been involved with the OHBM um, where yeah, about two years ago, I think Niels approached me to ask if I wanted to join the team and he convinced me by saying that I can write about work-life balance if I want. 
Um, and then I started and then at some point I realized that actually fits in quite well with my aspiration to make the field a little bit better and provide some resources, for example, with the tutorials. And I think Aperture is also a really good step in the direction of providing a bit broader education. Because when I think back about my first project in my master's, I really was really relying on other people to guide me and help. And not everyone's lucky enough to end up with a department working with the experts in the field. And then also, we can't be an expert in everything, right? So I feel like this is really necessary. And then the whole open science movement has been trying to follow with this a little bit and um, got involved a bit with our own initiative. But yeah, I'm quite optimistic that it will move on quite a bit in the next few years. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of my bit 